things? Yeah. Are there vents coming up? And like if it was an old drive cleaner, what you'll see. Are there areas where the concrete is just eaten away? Perk chews away concrete. Just chews it away. Um, so anyway, so the next, so yeah, we still want the property. We think there's some issues, so let's throw some holes in the ground. That's your phase two. So now we've identified the extent. Any of this, is this interesting at all? Am I doing okay, guys? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so now you just, now we're going to figure it out. We know what it is. It's like we know the horse is sick. We know what the horse is sick with. Now we've got to figure out what are we going to do to fix it. And so there's all kinds of ways you can fix it. My industry is a niche. I'm like a, I'm like a boutique industry within the remediation world. Because bioremediation, it takes time. You know, we're, we're creating an ecosystem. We're trying to get a floor to develop. And we're trying to get organisms to do their thing. Um, the fastest and the quickest way is what we call hog and haul. You dig it up and you ship it off to a landfill. And you're looking at least 100 bucks a ton to do that. For every ton of soil you take out, one dump truck holds 25 tons. So if you see a dump truck, leave it aside. Like this big pile of dirt over here where your lunchroom is being built. Um, for every, you probably got 25 trucks right there in that. Yeah. For every one of those trucks, 20, that's probably three. Probably five thousand dollars in contaminated dirt would cost your transportation and disposal fee. So you probably got twenty trucks out there. So that's what hundred k. That pile of dirt out there would cost you hundred thousand dollars to get offsite. It's expensive. It's um, prevent it. Another way, one of the ways you minimize those costs is you leave it on site. If you got room, you dig it up, fill in because you know, it's quicker. We've now cleaned it. Fill it in with clean dirt. And then on site, take the dirty stuff and you could soil wash. It's like putting in a, in a pug mill or a uh, conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt, you, you, as a little bit of dirt goes by, you're sprinkling, sprinkling in what we call magic foo-foo dust. And what that does is it treats the soil so that now the soil is clean and you could possibly reuse it on site. Or if you still have to ship it off site, it's not contaminated anymore, so it's a lot cheaper. So, so that would be soil washing magic or, foo -foo dust? Is that, or is that stabilization. Magic, magic foo-foo dust is kind of what I sell. Um, oh, my, I see, I see. Magic foo-foo dust is a, what I mentioned in the classroom beforehand. On soil washing, it's done a lot with metals. And so is stabilization. They're both done a lot with metals. Lead, cadmium. Organics get destroyed. If it's an organic compound like a solvent or a petroleum hydrocarbon, we destroy that molecule. If it's an inorganic molecule, like a metal, it just gets converted. You have to change its, 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 its basic uh, um, a, a framework. We've got to give it a bonding set. Example, lead. Lead. Uh, used lead and gas years and years ago. You have a gas spill. Not only do you have petroleum in the ground, you have lead contaminant in the ground. Petroleum is easy to treat. Lead's a little tougher. Well, and, and you can't get bugs to eat lead. So what we have to do, and the problem, the reason the lead is a contaminant is it has a free bonding site. It's a radical. It's looking for something to latch onto. It's got its hands out looking for a buddy. And you might be the buddy. The plants might be the buddy. You know, something's going to be the buddy. So what we do through soil washing and stabilization is we give it a buddy, typically silicon. And so you create a silicate, a precipitate. You give it a bonding site, so now it can't bond. It's not radical anymore. It's, we've not, we haven't done anything to lead. We didn't take it anywhere. So if you analyze for total lead, it's pretty much going to be the same level. But if you analyze what we're, we're concerned with, leachable lead, can it leach into the groundwater, you've fixed it, F-I-F, you fixed it, and it no longer can leach into the water. Does that make any sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Um, incineration, we talked about that, we just burn it. What we used to do with petroleum and dirt is if you had a lot of room, we'd spread it out in the parking lot. I grew up in Southern California, that's where I started. We'd spread it out in the parking lot. Nice sunny days, you know, 340 days, 50 days out of the, out of the year. You'd look across that parking lot and you could just, the building across the way was all wavy, like on a hot summer day looking at the asphalt in the desert. Because all those volatile organics were volatilizing into the atmosphere. They were leaving the soil, 
and go into the atmosphere. Well, the AQMD, the Air Quality Management District, deemed that cheap. Because all we were doing was taking a soil problem and adding to an air problem. So what we do now is we send it off to a facility to burn. Uh, Loudon, over here in Loudon, there's the ESMI facility. Um, as you drive by, it's down in a hollow, there's a big stack. Um, steam coming out of there. He burns dirt. And if you drive by Tilton Auto, across from Lowe's, on the right-hand side, you'll see that flat area where they park cars, and it's all this dark, black, grainy like stuff. That's burnt dirt. A reused burnt dirt. Um, but what happens, instead of having it just volatilize into the atmosphere, at the top of his um, vent is a scrubber. And so we're transferring it from the soil, the scrubber's capturing it, and so rather than having to dispose of all that dirt, ultimately we'll just have to, we're minimizing the waste volume, maximizing its concentration. It's like biomagnification. Um, um, I did a job in San Diego for the Port Authority. We had copper. Who, does anybody know what happens to water when you get copper in it? Uh, what, the, what happens to your basin, your water wash basin or your pipes? What color do they turn? Red. Blue. Oh. Blue. Copper sulfate. Just like your shirt. We went out to this. There was a, it was an old uh, Utah would bring in copper ore. And then we would, and they'd stockpile it on the ground, clamshell it in the ships to go over to China for manufacturing. Well, as they would clamshell, you'd lose a lot of that copper ore. Copper then was leachable. It got into a dissolved phase, got into the groundwater. The mollusks uptook it. All the shells in this area were the color of that shirt. I mean, it was cool, but it would be suck to be a mollusk, you know. Yeah, sure. Copper. But what happens when the, now this mollusk has a little bit of copper in it, and the birds start eating that copper? Well, that biomagnifies. The concentration of that copper in them intensifies, and then some bear or some wolf eats that, or a coyote eats it, and it gets worse for them. Same with us with lead or PCBs. We get this biomagnification. That's kind of what a scrubber does. We're just magnifying the waste collection point to try to minimize the amount of volume of waste having to go somewhere, because we're running out of landfill space. And then what do we do with the scrub? you got to go to a landfill. But pretty soon we're going to run out of landfill space. Nobody wants a landfill. Landfill in the bed. Everybody wants a landfill. Everybody wants their lights going on and off. Everybody wants a cell phone that does this for them and nine friggin' TVs. But nobody wants a landfill in their backyard. You know, so it's, the, it's, a, it's tough. It's hard. So trust me, I am not a bambiologist. <laughs> I'm Zeddy. Um, I started off doing this way back. I, started, I told you guys, I started as a turd herder. And, but before that, I actually worked for Audubon Society. I taught for Audubon in Wyoming. Like 17, 18, 19 years old. It was awesome, 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 awesome. Um, and at Audubon, you know, when I got into this industry, it was, golly, you know, we're going we're gonna to clean up the world. I'm going to go out, we're going to clean up the world. And unfortunately, you get out of the industry, and it's just, it's not fair. It's not that way. Um, I taught for Audubon, and then I get a job with, uh, I can't remember why I started this story, but then, then I got a job uh, with a major landfill company uh, in Southern California. Major, major landfill. Actually, the new football stadium where the Rams are going, I did the investigation at the Cal Compact Landfill. That was one of my sites, and that's where the new, so that was back 30, 30 years ago. Anyway, any time we stuck a shovel in the ground, they're all super fun sites, so any time I stuck a shovel in the ground, we had to have a public hearing. So we're having a public hearing in Compton, uh, California, and there's got to be 100, 200 people there. And I'm, golly, I was 19, 20 years old. We're going to go, we're going to clean up the world, you know. And EPA, our attorneys, me, consultants, you know, legislative representatives, it was a big deal. And this woman stands up, and I was in charge of the investigation. And the woman stands up and says, well, for gosh sakes, you guys have been drilling, people have been drilling at this site for years. Investigating, 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 and now you sit here and tell us you're going to investigate. When is somebody going to clean this up? And so I was called on to answer the question. And so I was going to go into this long explanation. You can tell I like to talk. Um, I was going to go into this explanation of quality assurance, quality control. You know, when we sample, there, there's protocols by which you throw a baler down in the ground. There's protocols by which we excavate things out of the ground. There's, protocols by which a laboratory analyzes it 
And everybody who does it has to abide by those protocols. And if you can't prove it, well, a lawyer is going to chew you up and none of your data means anything. So I get up and I say, oh, we're going to do quality control, quality insurance, and it's important because la da la da la I was going to educate this person. I'm going to help her understand. Because I see mom living next door to Cal Compact with Billy and Susie sitting out in the backyard with a swing set, a chain link fence separating them from me in level B PPE with a respirator going through her, don't worry, when 15 feet away her kids are hanging on the chain link fence watching. Yeah. Don't worry my ass. <laughs> you know, that's what she said. That's how I felt. And I'm not supposed to feel that. I'm the corporate side of things. Next thing I know, I feel this tug. And so I, I sit down, and our attorney stands up and says, what Mr. Armstrong's trying to say is there are protocols that need to be adhered to. They weren't in the past, and they will be moving forward. Thank you very much. Boom, done. You know, I'm looking at him. He didn't answer the question. I'm pissed. You know, I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I get home. It's like 12.30 at night. You couldn't leave the office without walking by the head attorney's door. By the time. Um, I'm walking out. Um, Ken, come on in. He was great. Ron Cage, great man. Taught me a lot. Taught me a lot. Sit down. I, I hear you had some fireworks today. And I, oh, I, was I had just come from Ottawa. I was frustrated. I told him the story. And he looks at me and he goes, you need to decide what side of the fence you're going to be on right now. You don't know who that woman was. You don't know why she was asking those questions. You don't know if she was a potential responsible party for why the contamination was there in the first part, trying to get you to say, I'll clean it, taking them off the hook financially. You don't know what their alternatives are. Everyone, this is, I'll never forget this. Everyone has an agenda. And it's sad. Everyone has an agenda. And in my world, our agendas cost a lot of money. The Lowe's in Claremont, it was supposed to be a $600,000 job. Boom, should have been done in 2003. In 2008, they stopped had spent $10 million, and from what I understand, there were $5 million more, and it was about $15 million. Because they didn't listen to it. It was a fun job, but it was scary. It was scary. So anyway, sorry, got off on a tangent there. So, that's awesome. So then so we, now we so, have the, you have, like, you look at the traditional methods of cleanup. You yeah, then there's me. You heat it, you treat it, you put it away somewhere where it's not near people, anybody cares about. And so what we do is we do bioremediation. And then rather than digging this stuff out and shipping it off site, we inject an additive, a solution, into the ground to either give food for these bugs who can breathe this solvent. There's all this solvent down in the ground, but there's no food for them. So I, I send food and other things to make them fit so that they can take advantage of this respiratory This is an source. example of food. What do you mean? Carbohydrates, sugars, as well as nutrients. Like so vitamins. you put that down in there and that gets them... And that gives them what they need to be fit. Once they're fit, they look around and they realize there's all this respiratory source, all this solvent around they can breathe, and they just go to town. On a, chlor on a, on a petroleum end of things... I give them something to breathe. Because when the, when the petroleum hydrocarbon gets into the ground, it's positively charged. Remember, oxygen has a negative. The first thing that happens when that petroleum gets in the ground, all the oxygen is taken away. So all those aerobic bugs down there are going, Ugh. Even, you know though there's, eat it. even though there's tons of food around them, they got nothing to breathe. So they can't do anything. So I give them something to breathe. And typically, I don't give them oxygen. I keep it anaerobic. I give them something other than oxygen. I give them an analog to oxygen. So that they can breathe under anaerobic conditions without oxygen. Once they can breathe, they'll eat. It's just like cleaning up your room. You know, it's summertime. You got your, you got your ass sitting on the sofa. You're watching cartoons. You're not doing a damn thing. Your room's a mess. Mom's going off to work or something. Says, hey. When I'm home, I want that place cleaned up. All right. You sit there. You keep making a mess. Because there's no additive. Nothing's been introduced. All of a sudden, you hear that car pulling back into the driveway. 
<laughs> That's an introduced additive. And I just shot in some additive. What happened? You get your ass off that sofa.